Will you uh, bow your heads as we pray and ask for God's help? Father, we want to know Jesus more. We want to love Jesus more. And we pray that you would show us him through your word and that you would show us the relevance of your word today and that you would convict us in our hearts. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. I don't know if you've read the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, it's a little bit dated now. I think it was written in the early 2000s. It's a great book. The subtitle of the book is The Story of Success. Uh, it's a book that seeks to answer the question, what makes some people so successful? What makes them outliers? In the second chapter, which is called The 10,000 Hours Theory, uh, Gladwell argues that to become proficient in your field, whether your field is music or art or sport or computers, raw talent is not enough. Those who have scaled the heights, like the Olympians, in addition to raw talent, have put in at least 10,000 hours of work. Success in any area of life, of course, is a gift from God. And like all gifts from God, it can be used for evil. Success can make us arrogant. In his excellent book on idolatry, Tim Keller says the following about success. More than any other idol, personal success and achievement lead to a sense that we ourselves are God that our security and value rest in our own wisdom, strength, and performance. To be the very best at what you do, to be at the top of the heap, means no one is like you. You are supreme. And that can lead, you making, that can lead to making you feel like you are a god. I think that almost certainly would have been the case with Pharaoh. In his society, in his time, he was considered a demigod. He would have been worshipped. He was powerful and educated and rich and confident. He resided over the superpower of the day. His word was rule. He was at the top of his game. By contrast to Pharaoh and his success, we have Moses and his failure. And so consider with me this morning on your outline the first heading, Moses' failure and God's promise. You know, there are three rather embarrassing mentions of Moses' failure that span this passage, uh, this story. So if you, if you have a Bible with you, you can just look back to the last couple of verses of chapter 5. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Chapter 6 and verse 12. Uh, Behold, said Moses to the Lord, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. And again, the final verse in chapter 6. Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? So far, Moses has just experienced failure. His audience with Pharaoh has yielded nothing but bad fruit. Instead of rescue for God's people who are slaves, Pharaoh has doubled the workload. Moses is disappointed in God. God's plan of rescue looks like it's not going too well. Even though he had those signs and wonders to show off to Pharaoh, do you remember when he could turn the stick into the snake and when his hand became leprous and then clean again? And when he turned water into blood, Pharaoh is unimpressed and he responds by hardening his heart and making life harder for the Israelites. And God responds, responds to Moses' failure by reminding Moses of his faithfulness to his promise. And so it's a wonderful thing to hear God speak to Moses. We are eavesdropping in on a conversation, a private conversation between God and Moses in verses 1 to 11 of the passage that John read for us. And I wonder if you noticed it as John read that actually it's the language of, of marriage. Let, let me show it to you. You know, four times God gives Moses his name again. I am the Lord. In verse 2, Chapter 6 and verse 2, God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. In verse 6, 
Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. Verse 7, I'll take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord. And again in verse 8, I will bring you into the land that I swore. I will give it to you in, for a possession for I am the Lord. Four times in one conversation, God gives Moses his name again, which is the word Yahweh, which translated is I am the Lord. I wonder why we, Moses needed to hear the name of the Lord four times in that conversation. He already knows the name of the Lord. Two weeks ago, if you were here, or if you heard the sermon online, we had the burning bush story where God introduced himself to Moses. He's known that God's name is I am the Lord. And so why does God have to repeat it here again? It struck me as I was thinking about it that actually in the marriage ceremony, do you remember when you were married? I don't know what it's like for you here, but in our country we'll say something like this. I grant, take you, Lilibet, to be my wedded wife, to heaven to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. Does that ring a bell for you? Are those the vows you use as well? Why do we say our names? It's not because we've forgotten who we've turned up to marry that day, is it? It's because it's a solemn occasion. That's the reason. It's the language of solemnity and oath and promise before making a pronouncement of commitment. Nothing is so reliable as God's promise. And God wants Moses to understand that he is the God of commitment and oath. Just like the faithfulness of a husband or a wife is expected within marriage, so God is saying that he is a faithful husband who will keep his promises. And so God takes Moses back over 400 years to the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am faithful to those promises. I am the Lord. They still hold. I haven't forgotten. I am the God of oath and commitment. I am Yahweh. It's the language of marriage. It's the equivalent of after a fight in your marriage and there's a bit of insecurity. It's a bit like taking your wife back to your wedding vows when she feels insecure about your love. Back to the marriage certificate. I don't actually recommend this, husbands. You know, if your wife says to you, do you still love me, darling? I don't recommend that you say to her, I said I loved you and that I would love you 30 years ago. I'll let you know if I've changed my mind. There's the signature on the wedding certificate. Nothing's changed. Of course it's true and it's an important part of uh, security in a marriage, but it's not warm and romantic, which is really what they are asking for. It lacks intimacy and warmth and romance. And so I don't want you to miss something magnificent in this passage. I want you to see that God is not only solemn and formal and reminding Moses that he is a promise keeper. I said it 30 years ago, 400 years ago. I'll let you know if I've changed my mind. But actually there is an intimacy here in this language as well, a warmth. And you'll see it in verse 6 of chapter 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord... I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Isn't that a lovely statement from God? You will be my people and I will be your God. It's a statement of a lover wooing his spouse or her spouse. It's a picture of tenderness and intimacy, a picture of protection and security. It's a picture really of being swept off your feet. I will be your God and you will be my bride. He'll take them from being slaves to Pharaoh, under Pharaoh, to being a loved bride under the rule of God. I think what God is saying to Moses in verse 6 and 7 about the Israelites is something that we need to hear today and to believe. 
God is not only going to rescue the Israelites from slavery. God is rescuing Israel for intimate and personal relationship with himself. You will be my people and I will be your God. It's a lovely picture of relationship with God. When God rescues, it's double-barreled. He rescues us from something and he rescues us for something. Uh, many people misunderstand this about God. Often we want one without the other. And we want God to deliver us from a particular situation. Something unpleasant, perhaps. But we're not actually interested in what we are rescued for. Namely, for a personal relationship with God. We want God for what God can give us. But we don't want God for God. But God is interested in more than just delivering us from a particular situation. He wants to know us. He wants us to know him. He wants marriage with all of its warmth and intimacy. He wants us to be his people and for him to be our God. I wonder if that's true of you this morning. Can you say that you know God? That you have a personal, intimate, growing relationship with the God who made the heavens and the earth? I'm not asking if you know about God. I'm asking if you know God. In 1993, uh, my father, who was a, a minister of a very large church in Cape Town, had his church broken into during a service by gunmen who shot upon the congregation and threw two hand grenades into the congregation, killing 12 people and injuring over 50. There were 1,200 people there that night. It was called the St. James Church Massacre, which has a Wikipedia page dedicated to it if you're interested to read more. It was a time in our country of real uncertainty and unsettledness politically. Nelson Mandela had recently been released. The ANC had recently been unbanned. And it was a movement, it was one year before our first democratic elections. And so there was a real downward spiral of violence in the country and certain aspects of the political spectrum were hitting soft targets like churches and restaurants. And ours was the first of a string of soft targets. And an amazing thing happened in the days following the massacre. Nelson Mandela, the great statesman, phoned our home to speak to my father to give his condolences for what had happened in the church. And my father wasn't home, and so my kid brother picked up the phone. And uh, I don't know if he understood how momentous it was to speak to the great Mr. Mandela. Oh, sorry, my dad's not home. Could you call back? You know, I mean, you don't speak to Mr. Mandela like that. You kind of keep him on the line as long as possible. It wouldn't be true, though, would it, for me to say to you today that my brother knows Mr. Mandela. He only spoke to him once for a short call. If only I had answered the phone, it would have been a longer call. It wouldn't be true. It would be a bit of a stretch to say that they knew each other and were intimate friends. The greatest and the most powerful person in the entire universe is committed to entering into a faithful, solemn, and intimate relationship with you and with me. We can have that personal relationship with God today. You don't have to jump through any hoops. You don't have to become a member of any church. You don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. You don't have to meet a certain standard. That offer is on the table today, where you are and as you are. So kind of God. You know, the second half of the chapter, which John, I'm sure you're very glad I didn't ask you to read, is one of those long genealogies in the Bible where you lose the will to live as it's being read. And you hope that you aren't the one reading on the day that that passage comes up. We've got to ask the question, why is that genealogy here? It's the genealogy of Moses and Aaron, his brother. 
It gives us their pedigree. It authenticates that this was Moses and Aaron that did these things. Look at verse 26. These are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Israel, from the land of Egypt. It's there to authenticate that this is the Moses and the Aaron, Aaron who come from this genealogy. But you know, there's a second reason why the genealogy is there. It underscores for us just how unimportant Moses was. He's not special at all. He doesn't come from a famous or a particularly influential family. He's not a descendant of Jacob's first son, Reuben. He comes from Jacob's third son, Levi. He doesn't come from Levi's firstborn son, and Moses himself is not even the firstborn in his own nuclear family. This is very significant because in the ancient world, your placement in the birth order was held to be much more significant than it is in our culture today. The point is, Moses was a nobody. He was insignificant. We would never have noticed him. We would never have entrusted him with such an important task. And it's as though God is saying, in spite of your failure, Moses, in spite of your insignificant pedigree, Moses, I am going to use you to fulfill my promises. God's ways are not our ways. We are impressed by success, money, education, breeding, but not God. There is nothing in the story of the Exodus to make you think that anything happened as a result of Moses or his skills or his influence or his learning. There is no doubt as to who the hero is in the book of Exodus. It's not Moses. If anything is going to happen, it can't be Moses the failure, Moses the insignificant. It's going to be by the in intervention of the Lord. And so Moses' failure and God's promise. That's my first point. Here's the second point this morning. Moses' weakness and God's power. I hope that over these last few weeks, if you've listened to the talks, that one of the things you've, you're learning with me as we've gone through Exodus is that God really does rule over every power in the world. Of course, this is not what our world thinks. We live in a culture where God is a personal opinion best kept to yourself. We can be lulled, really, in that environment into thinking that God is not in control if he exists at all. He's asleep, he's unwilling, he's unaware. Of course, it's not a new way of thinking. It really does suit the human race to deny that God is the rightful ruler of the universe because then I can essentially live the way I want to live without any reference to God or acknowledgement of his claim over my life. That's the default setting of the human heart. And we saw it last week. Do you remember those who were here or heard the talk online, chapter 5 and verse 2, when Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? It's really the cry of our culture. Who is the Lord that we should obey him? The rule of God is hidden from those who do not have eyes to see. Because of Pharaoh's contempt for the God of Israel, he has contempt for the people of God, and he treats them abominably. And as we edge in the story towards the great plagues that take place from chapter 7 and following, we are entering a period in the world's history where even those who do not believe in God will be convinced that the God of Israel the God of the nation of the weak and the oppressed slaves is in fact the ruler of the world. Quite suddenly, God's power will be displayed to the nations, unleashed against Pharaoh through the plagues, such that the news of it will carry to the ends of the earth. Even for people who don't believe in God, it'll be unmistakable that God is the ruler of the world. The book of Exodus will remove the veil and reveal to us God's mighty, unopposed, and inevitable rule. And do you know that what was true in the days of Exodus is true in our day as well? 
At the end of chapter 6, Moses says, My speech is uncircumcised. That is, I have failed to convince Pharaoh. My speech is weak and unconvincing and without effect. And God replies that at a time when no earthly power could challenge Pharaoh, God says the most extraordinary thing to Moses in chapter 7 and verse 1 and 2. If you have your Bible open, you can look at it with me. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of this land. God will overrule Moses' uncircumcised speech. In fact, Moses will have godlike authority over Pharaoh, the great successful one, the outlier. And look at what happens in verse 6 of chapter 7. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Here is the first time we see success in the life of Moses. He obeys God's word. He does what God says. They respond in obedience to God in spite of being in their early 80s. At that point, Moses, who has really been a failure, obeys God. And brothers and sisters, friends, that is true success in this life. Not power, not wealth, not cleverness, not even super spirituality. To succeed in God's economy. You don't need to be beautiful or clever or talented or successful or wealthy. You need to be obedient. And do you know that the, the New Testament continues that theme and calls us to obedience to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament's word to us, God's word to us today, is not quite the same as God's word to Pharaoh thousands of years ago. God's word to us today is, will you come and receive my son? Depending on his death for the forgiveness of your sins, relying on his resurrection for hope of eternal life, and will you submit to him and give over your whole life to him in faith and repentance? That's God's word to us today. And if we want to be successes according to God's view, we need to accept that word. Have you accepted that word? It's easy to rejoice in success. Pharaoh, who is rich, educated, successful, powerful, so powerful, in fact, that he was worshipped as a god, he will be shown to be the failure that he is. In the coming chapters. God's power and rule are shown as he puts his hand on Pharaoh's heart. Look at ch chapter 7 if you have it open there in verse 3. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. For the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. God's power and rule are shown not only as he puts his hand on Pharaoh's heart. But as he touches Pharaoh's kingdom. Look at verse 4. Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. God's word can lead to the hardening of hearts. You know, whenever God's word is read and explained, as it is faithfully every week from this pulpit, there are always two things taking place. Hearts are being softened and hearts are being hardened. And do you know that both are the work of God? I will harden Pharaoh's heart, says God. I will bring his kingdom down, says God. And the New Testament has warnings for us, brothers and sisters. 
I'm sorry um, that I didn't include verse 8 in my outline. That was my mistake. But Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8 says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Here is a call for us to have soft hearts when we hear the word of God. Verse 12 of the same chapter of Hebrews says, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, uh, be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's a word to me today, and I'll be very surprised if it's not a word to you too. As we hear the word of God, there will be those who are hard against the word of God. I want to, I want to ask you this, this morning, won't you reconsider your position and soften your heart and come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and repentance? Many of you have done that. The warning to us today is, will we keep on being soft to the word of God and not become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? Well, let's pray that that will not be true of us. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this word to us this morning. Thank you for how relevant it is in spite of having been written thousands of years ago. Thank you for your kindness in seeking us out and wanting intimate and personal relationship with us. Thank you that you have made that possible through the death of and the resurrection of your dear Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would respond rightly this morning by softening our hearts to you. Maybe for the first time. Or maybe we know that we have wondered and have been, there's been a growing hardness as we have entertained sin and its deceitfulness. Have mercy on us, we pray. Do not give us over to ourselves. Soften us and draw us towards yourself so that we may be your people and you our God. And we pray this in the wonderful name of Christ our Savior. Amen.